Hello everyone, I'm John Lister Kay. I run a field study centre in the Highlands of Scotland on the River Bewley. We handle 7,000 Highland school kids every year on environmental education programmes and also 750 adults on uh, field studies programmes. Um, it's a pleasure to be with the Cairngorms Big Nature Weekend tonight. Um, now, I've put together some uh, uh, images to try and demonstrate where we've been and where we're heading. So, uh, the buzzword is rewilding. Uh, we don't use it at Agus because we use the term restoration ecology instead, because we think that's slightly clearer to people. Uh, unfortunately, rewilding to some people just means uh, bringing back wolves. So um, uh, restoration ecology is the challenge we all face, rebuilding natural capital for future generations. The best exemplar of the problem that we've got is the uh, um, original scope of the ancient Caledonian pine forest as identified by the late great Sir Frank Fraser Darling. And the pale green shows you that it was a very, very extensive forest of bogs and uh, um, birch wood and um, alder car and, and native woodland. And all that we've got left are the dark green dots, some of which are nature reserves, other, others of which are just really a few trees on a knoll. So the impact of man's activities and gradual climate change has dramatically uh, removed that uh, forest uh, landscape. We exterminated all our big wild animals and destroyed habitat. We lost the wolf, the brown bear, the lynx, probably the moose, uh, the beaver for certain, wild boar were hunted out. Uh, we went on to destroy the great sea eagle, uh, the uh, ospreys were pushed down to the last pair on the Findhorn in the 1950s by persecution. Similarly, the red kite was pushed into extinction and the capercaillie, because of loss of habitat, has had to be reintroduced several times, actually pretty unsuccessfully. The Scottish wildcat uh, is in a very parlous state at the moment. We don't think there are any pure wildcats left uh, and the government is trying to do something about it. The pine martin 25, 30 years ago was also on the brink of extinction, but has luckily managed to come back. And then a lot of people don't know or understand that we wouldn't have our iconic golden eagles if it wasn't for the numbers of deer dying in the winter months, uh, a supply of carrion, because the hills don't have uh, the natural prey uh, for golden eagles any longer. And the, the latest uh, on uh, disappearing species, of course, is the corncrake. Everybody knows that that's in dire trouble, pushed right to the outer isles. Corn buntings are disappearing rapidly. Hen harriers are being persecuted out of sight. And curlews and lapwings are declining dramatically, probably as a consequence of uh, climate change. This photograph is of the uplands in Russia, a few miles north of my home. And this was once Climax Pine Forest. The degradation of the uplands is still not accepted or properly understood by many. So right across this landscape, right up to the, uh, the bottom of the quarry would have been ancient Caledonian pine forest. So the highlands is exquisitely beautiful, but also significantly empty. So what do you do about it? Well, restoration ecology, we believe, is the answer. And it means putting things back. It means recreating habitats. And we started a beaver demonstration project in 2006. We introduced a pair of beavers and they have been a, a huge success. Sea eagles were introduced to rum in 1975. There are now 140 pairs. Uh, um, across uh, the highlands, but also now being reintroduced to England. Um, uh, the um, red kite was introduced uh, very successfully and now uh, graces our skies right across the highlands all the time. And there is a government led uh, Scottish wildcat captive breeding project, uh, which is going forward and hopefully will be in a position to uh, release captive bred wild cats back into the wild fairly soon.
Those are the first kittens that we had born uh, um, in our captive breeding project here at Agus. Yet, while these species restoration projects have been successful, the world has continued to inflict terrible damage. And something else is beginning to happen. You may have noticed that the world is changing. Young people are no longer happy with where we are. And all these organizations, uh, um, Extinction Rebellion, uh, the, the uh, climate change organizations are now being very vociferous and are bringing uh, um, uh, the problems to the attention of politicians. They've got to listen. So people power has begun to demand an end to fossil fuel consumption and is creating a market advantage for going green. Governments must now listen, provide incentives and respond quickly. Young people no longer accept the status quo and are demanding change. Carbon emissions must be halted and agriculture must become sustainable to protect soils. The consequences of doing nothing are devastating and you can see that right across the globe every year on our television sc screens. Extreme weather events, forest fires, droughts, floods, you name it. This quotation from the great late Older Leopold uh, comes from uh, 1946. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. So we have a project called Living Forests, and we believe that we can all work towards creating living forests. Um, The broadleaf deciduous component in all woods needs to be far larger, at least 50% to create living forests. Intensive tree farms of fast growing exotic species have dominated our landscapes for 50 years. We need to apply the principles of restoration ecology and living forests to all our woodland plantings. A restoration ecology vision calls for much more woodland but designed by a living forest culture. Many of Scotland's bare hills could be forested with multi-age class, continuous cover, biodiverse woods, conifer and broadleaf for sensitive commercial use. Deadwood is an essential component of a living forest, especially for saprophytic fungi and the vital process of returning nutrients to the soil, essential for food and habitat for many species of bugs, beetles and other insects. Because of the overuse of pesticides, we now face an invertebrate crisis. Uh, anybody who keeps bees will know that uh, um, uh, neonic uh, um, uh, pesticides used by agriculture are a disaster. And of course, that will affect the whole food chain. Most birds at some stage in their uh, life are dependent uh, upon invertebrates. Wetland is extremely important for biodiversity. Traditional drainage techniques need to be modified to allow wetland to flourish for frogs, for toads, for newts, and for others. And of course, beavers, a keystone species that belong to wetland ecosystem. The Scottish wildcat is our most endangered mammal. Hares, rabbits, voles, and mice are an important part of the wildcat's diet. We need to be sure that those prey species are present in habitat suitable for wildcat. And environmental education should be an essential component of the national curriculum. Starting young is absolutely vital. Teaching children to appreciate nature, to understand nature, not to be frightened of it and to enjoy it. So the challenge for us all is to make it happen. And there's a lovely quote from the great American environmental poet, Garrick, Gary Snyder, stay together, know the flowers, go light. The future is restoration ecology. Probably the moose, we aren't quite sure about that. Certainly the beaver hunted out, wild boar. Um, we uh, uh, persecuted sea eagles into extinction. We pushed ospreys right down to the last pair on the Fintorn in the 1950s. 
Capercaillie into extinction because of loss of habitat, and they've had to be reintroduced at least three times. Um, and red kites were also poisoned into extinction. We at the at present, we face a crisis with uh, uh, wildcats, Felis sylvestris, and as many people will know, there is a government initiative to try and rescue it, although it's a really uphill struggle. And the poor old pine martin also got very seriously persecuted, but has luckily made a comeback. But a lot of people don't understand that our golden eagles, the icon of wild highlands, can really only survive in the West Highlands because of dead deer in the winter. If you take the dead deer away, uh, there, are not enough, there is not enough natural prey because the uplands are so degraded. So um, we're going backwards, here we go. Uh, so th for the present day, um, we are still losing ground with corn crakes, uh, with corn buntings, hen harriers are still being extensively persecuted and nobody really quite knows why, but it's probably something to do with climate change our curlews and our lapwings are very rapidly disappearing. So it's not a very happy story. Um, uh, and also people don't understand the history of the uplands. This photograph was once Climax Pine Forest right up to the quarry at the top. Um, but the degradation that has taken place following deforestation by human beings over the last five, six, seven hundred years has resulted in um, uh, what the great late Sir Frank Fraser Darling called uh, a wet desert. Uh, and it's beautiful and we love it and uh, um, uh, we're very proud of our uplands, but they are seriously degraded. The islands is exquisitely beautiful, but significantly empty. So restoration ecology is the only answer. It's the only route that we've got to try and do something about this. And uh, we uh, uh, put beavers in as a demonstration project in 2006. And that was the first restoration ecology project that we did. Sea eagles were introduced to Rum in 1975, now 140 pairs. So that's a very successful restoration ecology project. Uh, red kites, as everybody knows, have done extremely well following reintroduction. And uh, the captive wild, uh, the wildcat captive breeding program uh, being contributed to by many different breeders around Scotland is making good progress with captive breeding, but has yet to uh, release uh, wildcats back into the wild. So the jury is out on how uh, straightforward that's going to, to be. Um, I need to go back because uh, I've skipped, here we go. Um, but um, things are not straightforward. You know, I can't go back, I, I won't bother. Um, the world is changing very rapidly. Young people no longer accept the status quo and are demanding change. Carbon emissions must be halted and agriculture must become sustainable to protect soils. The consequences of doing nothing are absolutely devastating. And I think we all know that story. I'm struck by an Aldo Leopold quote uh, from 1946. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. Um, what a wise man he was. And I believe that we should be working towards what I'm calling living forests. Um, intensive tree farms of fast growing exotic species have dominated our landscapes for 50 years. We need to apply the principles of restoration ecology and living forests to all our wooding, woodland plantings going forward. Um, the, the, the figures for carbon capture and carbon loss into the atmosphere from plantations are really pretty scary. The broadleaf deciduous component in all woods needs to be far larger than it is at the moment. It's only allowed to be 20% at the moment. It needs to be at least 50% to create living forests. 
So a restoration ecology vision calls for much more woodland for, as a carbon sink uh, and also for biodiversity, but designed by a living forest culture. Many of Scotland's bare hills could be forested with multi-age class, continuous cover, biodiverse woods, uh, conifer and broadleaf for sensitive commercial use. Deadwood is an essential component of a living forest, and it's one that we've ignored in Scotland for a very long time, especially uh, it's important for saprophytic fungi and the vital process of returning nutrients to the soils. Essential food and habitat for many species of bugs, beetles and other insects in deadwood. Uh, but because of the overuse of pesticides, we now face an invertebrate crisis and anybody who keeps bees will know all about that. And of course, an invertebrate crisis means a crisis for birds and for other species. Wetland is extremely important for biodiversity. That can't be overemphasized. Traditional drainage techniques need to be modified to allow wetland to flourish for frogs, for toads, for newts, uh, and of course, birds. And beavers are keystone species that belong to wetland ecosystems. And you know, you have to comment, you have to say that the uh, reintroduction of the beaver to Scotland has been messy, and at the moment, we're probably killing more beavers than there are those being born. The Scottish wildcat is our most endangered mammal. It needs hares, rabbits, voles, and mice, an important part of the wildcat's desert uh, diet. We need to uh, look after the habitat uh, and make sure that those prey species are available. And environmental education should be an essential component of the national curriculum. Starting young is absolutely vital so that people grow up understanding essential environmental issues and not being afraid of the natural environment. So the challenge is to make it happen. Lovely quote from Gary Snyder, stay together, know the flowers, go light. The new dawn is restoration ecology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. That got us off to a great start. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Helen Todd, who's going, who's from Rambler, Scotland, and who's going to give us some of her thoughts. Thank you very much, Deborah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Right, well, how do I follow that? <laughs> um, yes, I'm from Rambler, Scotland, and I'm not going to tell you all how great it is to be active outdoors, active in nature, because I'm sure you already know you're already converted. Um, and now science is catching up as well. We're getting more and more evidence of this, and it's Mental Health Awareness Week, so it's worth looking at you know, all of this relevant research that's been published in the last um, few years. And it seems that just being in nature beats depression, reduces stress, it's beneficial for the heart, and it, and it even strengthens our immune system and our resilience against viruses, which could come in handy. Now, you know, you're probably all outdoorsy folk, and this might sound like the bleeding obvious to you, but demonstrating the value of nature for people is a very persuasive public health message, and it's very important. So we clearly need nature, but nature also needs us well. How do you learn to care about nature and the environment if you never go there? You might watch Spring Watch at Mar Lodge on TV, but if you've never smelt a Caledonian pine wood or heard the first cuckoo in spring, are you going to be personally motivated to protect nature? Now, as, as John has said, nature is in peril. We need people to care and to fight for it. And how do we, we, how do we bring people on board? Obviously, Education, as, as John has said, is, is phenomenally important, but I, I think outdoor recreation also offers a way in. Now, last summer, we all saw pictures of mayhem caused by some visitors in the Cairngorms and elsewhere, litters, abandoned tents, fires. But as well as all the challenges this brought, there were also many positives to take away and work with. So firstly, um, as a positive, the government has now realized they need to properly fund the infrastructure to cope with these visitors, and the education on responsible behavior too. But secondly, so many of the people we saw camping, walking, cycling were new to the outdoors and often they were young. 
Now, I took great comfort from the Cairngorms Rangers report to the, the board, which said that the majority of the behavior, the bad behavior they saw was done through ignorance, not malice. And I thought that was so important. People just didn't know they were not doing the right thing. So what an opportunity we now have to engage with these people um, and engage them with nature and to capitalize on their new interest in outdoor recreation. We can support them to do the right thing. And there are already are some great initiatives, the John Muir Award, the Rambler Zone Out There Award, Duke of Edinburgh and so on. But let's extend, extend the hand of welcome to a new generation. And wouldn't it be great if this horrendous pandemic and all these lockdowns gave birth to something positive for nature? Start here. Steve is joining us from Trees for Life. Hello, can you hear me? Great, thanks Steve, yeah. Okay. Thanks, I'm Steve, I'm the CEO of Trees for Life and I've been asked to speak for just a couple of minutes about whether rewilding and repeopling places like the Highlands can go together. So let me see if I can get this to work. That would be good, wouldn't it? There we go. So very quick, what, what is rewilding? For me, a very simple definition is it's about working with nature so landscapes can recover. Um, lots of other detail behind that, including the sort of science behind restoration ecology. But for me, rewilding is really changing the way we, we work, work and think about nature. And what is repeopling? It's enabling people to come back to an area where perhaps there were many more in previous times. And the big question for rewilding is, can the two work together? Can we get more people living and working in these remote rural communities that we all really love as a result of rewilding? Big issue for, for our part of Scotland because of history, because of the highland clearances where we saw massive falls in population because of large landowners essentially uh, moving people away from the land uh, uh, over a very long period of time. So it's, a, it's an issue of concern because of that history that, that goes with the highlands. And of course, our population in the highlands remains low. It's not a very densely populated area. So again, it's of concern when things change that could the change, could the changes caused by rewilding re result in a lower population? That's one of the big concerns that people come up with regularly. Again, if you look at our part of the world up here, we are very low in population. You know, some areas of Scandinavia are just as sparsely populated as we are in the highlands. So that's, a, that's an issue, that's a thing that constantly comes up when you talk about rewilding, a fear that rewilding will cause the population in, in our part of the world to fall even further. And there seem to be kind of two viewpoints about rewilding. The first viewpoint is uh, rewilding is just another highland clearance. You know, rich people are buying estates, they're rewilding them, and traditional jobs are going as a result of that. The other viewpoint, which is, one I, which is the one I subscribe to, is that actually rewilding can enable people to come back to the highlands and to the remote rural areas because it creates nature-based jobs, increases employment in remote rural areas as opposed to reducing employment. What's the evidence of that? Well, a typical grouse moor employs about three and a half staff and that's a, a, a figure from the, the Game and Wildlife uh, Trust. And there are about 1300 paid, paid jobs in deer stalking uh, in Scotland. So not that many jobs in those sort of traditional uh, uh, sort of land management areas. At Dundregan, which is the estate we own uh, uh, up in uh, up in Invermorriston, we currently employ eight staff there. When we bought it in 2008, there was just one, there was just one deer stalker working at Dundregan. He's still there, but there are seven other staff working on, on that estate. And we, when we open a rewilding center there next year, we expect to employ another 15 staff to welcome people and introduce them to rewilding. And a survey by Rewilding Britain around rewilded land down in England showed that when land was rewilded, when nature-based solutions were brought onto the land, jobs increased by 47%. So the evidence seems to show that if, the, if you do rewilding, if you rewild land, employment will go up. And if employment goes up, it means more people will be able to live as well as work in the landscape. And I think this graphic from the Scottish Rewilding Alliance indicates what we're sort of aiming for with rewilding, with more people enjoying, experiencing, working in the highlands, enjoying it, 
and getting something out of it. Money circulates around our economy and with money circulating around the economy, we get more livelihoods, more people being able to live here. And with rewilding, it's about changing the way in which some existing jobs operate. So for me, traditional jobs get repurposed in rewilding. We still have a deer stalker at Dundragon. He's just doing it to, to control deer numbers so the forest can recover. Again, traditional farming, we might see natural grazing coming in and farming slightly changing so that it's more about natural grazing in the future. We also think that new land-based jobs will be created with all the emphasis on the benefits of peatlands and planting trees and growing trees for carbon. We need to find ways of measuring it and getting people out into the field to find out what's really happening with our environment. We also think that rewilding helps to create more nature-based businesses, such as sustainable timber use, rather than just chopping all the trees down, sending them out to the big smoke machine out near Inverness, actually doing higher value work with our timber so that we can get more value from it. And then of course, the big thing is around nature-based tourism and how that grows so that more people can actually get closer to nature, do the sort of things that John does out so, so well at Agus, but many, many more people go, go at getting involved in that. So although there are legitimate concerns about changes to traditional jobs, we feel that with rewilding, there's enough evidence to show that there will be more jobs, more livelihoods, and therefore more people being able to live in the wonderful Highlands. And I'm going to hand back to Deborah. Many thanks, Steve. Um, I'm sure we'll get lots of questions about the rewilding, repeopling. Um, but before we head to questions, I'm going to hand over to Lauren. Lauren McCallum. Who's gonna... Hi, Deborah. And Excellent. Hi, Lauren. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm sorry if I see slightly, seem slightly distracted. I've just got uh, news. I've just become an auntie for the first time, literally about a few minutes ago. So, um, so I'm very happy. And uh, I think it sets a, a nice, uh, yeah, conversation about what what world um, my my nephew's coming in uh, coming into. So, yeah, uh, that's some good news to just receive a couple of minutes ago. Uh, but my name is Lauren McCallum, and I'm a, an activist, um, broadcaster, and author. I am general manager of Protect Our Winters UK, and Protect Our Winters UK is a climate change action charity that looks to inspire and equip uh, the outdoor community and outdoor industry to take meaningful action to address the climate crisis. Um, so that's what I do at, at, at my daily job. Um, and it's really about harnessing the passion um, and the influence of the outdoor community and really sort of, and the industry and using that so, so we can support ambitious climate policy um, and, and help uh, protect the outdoors and protect our winters. I'm really interested to, to speak with you all tonight. And personally, um, my take on this is that, you know, the climate crisis is a connection crisis. It's, a, it's what happens. And it's a result of a disconnection between ourselves, our land, and arguably uh, each other. And, um, and I think, you know, the outdoor communities uh, and communities in general have the answers to, to, to those um, to the climate crisis, to the the to this bit, this big problem, um, and I and I think that by speaking um, about these what I call sort of big issues through what people love, so through nature, through snowboarding and skiing and climbing and and um, and you know, the passions that people love, that is a really effective way that we can um, have these conversations. And so again, uh, looking forward to to unpacking that with you um, as well. So yeah, I've said I've um, I was given two minutes to introduce myself and um, yeah, thanks very much for having me along. Thanks very much, Lauren. So that's our panel. Um, hopefully they'll all magically appear on your screen any minute now, so you're not just looking at me. Um, and we are now open for questions. So if you'd like to put your questions into the chat bar, please, we will come to you. And if you're happy to read them out, then I will ask you to do that. If not, I will read them out on your behalf. Um, so we've heard from um, our four panelists. <clears throat> so John Lister Kay talked about the challenge and what we needed to do to make it better. 
Helen was talking about engaging people and getting people more in tune and understanding and close to nature so that they're more able to do something about it. Then we heard from Steve about wilding and peopling our future in Scotland. And Lauren's just outlined that we're actually, it's a connection crisis that we're looking at here, both for climate and for nature. So that's the, the summary of where we are. So I will open up the floor now. And um, Karen Blackport has a question. Karen, over to you to ask your question, please. Hello there, can you hear me? Yep. Hello. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for brilliant presentations. I've actually got a couple of questions, if that's OK. Um, the first one, um, there's so much information out there, social media, the news, literature, etc., and what we can do for the environment, for biodiversity. And it can be sometimes difficult for individuals to know how best to take solutions forward. And if the panel could advise what the single most important thing that we can do as individuals for nature, um, what would that be? And so that's my first question. And the second one's, I suppose, a little bit more technical. Um, I think it was last year we saw the publication of the Disrupta Review, looking at the economics of biodiversity. Um, now, there's been a lot of talk about, um, a lot of controversy about valuing biodiversity. Um, I would be really interested to hear what the panel thought of that. Some people think that's sensible to value biodiversity in nature. Other people think it's really objectionable we should be focusing on the intrinsic value of nature so that right okay i think i think we got the gist karen thank you very much there's two parts to that question and i'll come to i'll come to each of the panelists briefly so you can all answer it please what's the single most important thing that an individual can do and is the idea of valuing nature a good one or not um so John, shall we start with you? Is, is that all right? Yeah, very happy. Um, I think that my advice to individual people would be to get out there and actually experience nature in every way that floats your boat, whether it's um, walking or hiking or climbing or cycling or canoeing or whatever else, because unless you've got some direct experience, it's very difficult then to, to move on to the next stage. But having said that, um, it, during my lifetime, the, uh, the most significant contribution has been made by the NGOs, uh, whether it's Trees for Life, whether it's the RSPB, whether it's the Woodland Trust, whatever. Uh, supporting those NGOs is really, really important, not just with money, or well, that's vital, but also with uh, volunteering and action and, and joining in with stuff. So that would be my answer to the first question. Thank you very much. Helen, can we come to you next? Well, John kind of covered everything, but what I would say is um, individuals, obviously, every individual action is important, but, you know, um, it needs a lot more than that. It needs governments to change things. And I guess we've just had a general uh, a Scottish election. And I would say now is the time to start putting pressure on your local MSPs because, you know, you can do everything that John said. Of course, we should all do that anyway, but we really need to get to change at a much higher level. So political action, I think, is, uh, is what I would suggest. Great, thank you. The questions are coming in thick and fast now. So I'll go to Steve and then Lauren and then we'll move on to the next question. Steve? Okay, I'll try to be very quick then. Um, yeah, very much agree with what John had to say. I would also say uh, start in your own backyard. Think about your area, your community and what you can do if you band together with others to, to help rewilding, to help nature restoration to take place. A very simple example, I live in the middle of a forest um, in, near Fockabers, which is actually a pine forest, but if it was nature, uh, it would probably be an oak wood. So I've just planted an oak tree in my garden. So I hope that one day the squirrels will come and take the acorns, bury them in the forest, and many hundreds of years after I've long gone, the, oak, the, oak, the forest will return to being an oak forest. That's my, my little fantasy. So do what you can yourself. And if you can't do something on your own, work together with others. I don't want to be political at all, but we saw what people power can do just yesterday in Glasgow when um, they, they stopped some refugees uh, from being arrested, being taken away. So people power can make a difference. I'm, I'm not suggesting you storm anywhere, but, but do join together because it's so, so very, very powerful. 
and then also, as, as Helen said, be, be, we have to be a little bit more political anyway. And the Scottish Rewilding Alliance, for example, is calling for Scotland to become the world's first rewilding nation. That means the government putting money, resources and effort into rewilding uh, and not being quite so dependent on the sort of individual and community efforts that we're seeing now. And what about putting money on things? I would say very unfortunately, most of the people in power in society understand money more than they understand nature very, very sadly. So if we can find ways of valuing wildlife, valuing nature, valuing what it does for us, uh, so that it means something to those people that only unfortunately look at numbers, then that's something worth doing. But for me, it's the intrinsic value that matters most and we have to get that balance right. Thanks, Steve. Lauren? Yeah, no, great answers from the panel so far. And again, uh, great to see people supporting NGO as a, <laughs> as a general manager of, uh, of a climate action NGO. I would definitely support that action. Um, but for, for me, it is around um, going and speaking to our policymakers and, and going and seeing the white of their eyes and saying, listen, this is not good enough. We need to see more climate ambition. And also just having the confidence that you don't have to be an expert. I think in this day and age, we're, we're, we're almost forced or expected to be uh, experts in everything. And that's what POW does is, is, you know, when you go or protect our winter, sorry, I keep calling it POW, but that's what protect our winters does is that we say to people, you know, your experiences in the outdoors. So when I go and speak to my local um, MP or MSP, you know, I go and speak to Kate because I live in Abbeymore. And, you know, I, I talk to her as a general manager of Protector Winters UK, but I talk to her mostly as a snowboarder and say, listen, I'm really, really worried about what's happening and, and relay those experiences. And I think the more we can have those conversations and have those and relay our experiences, it's a lot more inviting for people to join because we kind of talk about facts and figures and numbers and things. People just kind of become a bit overwhelmed. But I think the personal stories will, will help people um, buy into to our vision for a, for a net zero world. Thanks, Lauren. That got us off to a great start with that first question, Karen. Um, I'm going to come to Kerry Ross next. Kerry, you, you're happy to read out your question? Yeah, very much so. So uh, thanks very much, all uh, the panellists. I should say I work for the John Muir Trust, um, but I'm here uh, as an individual this evening. So my question is not on behalf of the Trust. It's on behalf of Kerry Ross, the individual. Um, but I guess the question was, so I uh, should say I, I live in the Highlands um, and was, um, so uh, Perthshire, sorry, and was very aware that the people visiting Shahalian um, as one of the, the um, honeypots, shall we say, of um, the Monroe areas uh, last summer was not just, or were not, sorry, were not just young individuals. So picking up on uh, Sir John's point um, and Helen's point um, about um, responsible access and about how we engage the young generation, so I'm delighted to hear it's coming into the curriculum and also the work that Sir John does and also the work that we do through the John Muir Award, but really aware um, that it's not just people that are at school age that are visiting the highlands and wild land for the first time. So what role, I, I mean, I think we're all aware of what role we hold in terms of making people aware of how important it is to access those wild places in a responsible manner. But what role do the panelists feel the, pub, the private sector holds? So when you book a caravan or a motor home, is there something that people should be doing there? When you buy a tent from Millets, when you buy a tent from Tyso, sorry, I don't mean individual organisations, but is there more that the people who are making the money off the industry should be doing to say, guys, before you go, this is what you need to know? Otherwise, I sort of feel like I absolutely agree with getting in right at the, right at the base level for children. But, but also it's the, it's the parents and the individuals that are taking their children there that I feel have some role to play as well. I'm just, just keen uh, to hear the, the panelists' views on that. Sorry, the question probably took longer okay. than the answer. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks Kerry. Um, I'll, I'll come to, to John first and then Helen perhaps again. John, would you like to answer? Yeah, it, I mean, this is a very, very difficult subject to address because there is no doubt at all that we, the great human race are capable of loving nature to death and it's happened many many times in many countries all around the world uh, the example of uh, 46 minibuses surrounding a 
three lionesses on the Masai Mara is the classic example, and it's horrendous. Um, uh, and so uh, I, I personally believe that environmental education is the way forward. And I think if it was somehow possible to make um, uh, people who sell tents or outdoor equipment uh, um, uh, encourage responsible access and uh, um, encourage more understanding and better understanding of wildland and nature, obviously that would be hugely beneficial, although it's an extremely difficult thing to do. And unfortunately, going back to the previous question, this business of putting a value on nature uh, absolutely appalls me. I would hate to think that, uh, you know, a bee beetle has a, a monetary value. Uh, so for me, please don't go there. But obviously, ecotourism has uh, an economic value and we live in a capitalist society. And so it makes sense to talk that language about uh, um, the value of uh, people rewilding or uh, visiting the highlands or uh, doing uh, ecotourism or environmental education or whatever else and, and, and shouting about that value. I mean, Steve mentioned it in Trees for Life. Uh, it, there's no doubt at all that there is very real value in what most of us, I think, would like to see going forward. But, um, but we haven't been good at shouting about that in the past. So tricky question, but I do think that we need to try and promote better and more responsible access to wildland. Hello, yeah. the role of the private sector? Yeah, it, private sector definitely has a role, um, but I mean, we all do public sector, third sector. Um, I would say that um, for a long time, um, there hasn't been so much uh, attention paid to visitor management, to education on Scottish Outdoor Access Code and so on. We've been pushing for many, many years through the National Access Forum to, to get more investment into this kind of thing, because yes, it's great that kids learn about it at school, if they do, but what about the rest of the, the population? And I think last year and potentially coming this year as well, we've seen the, the result of that lack of investment in infrastructure and in, in education. And it's so much easier for people to do the right thing when the infrastructure is there. If there is a, a bin, if there are toilets, if there's a ranger service that will go out and talk to people, it's so much easier for people to do the right thing. And what I would say is what has come out very positively from this last year, this experience, is that government has recognised this. So, I mean, we, you know, we've been talking for many, many years. Um, the recreation um, on Scottish residents alone is worth 2.6 billion pounds to the Scottish economy. Walking tourism alone, 1.26 billion. I mean, these are ma massive um, contributors to the economy, especially in rural areas. And it seems to be that they've been treated like the, the golden goose and oh, brilliant, you know, all this money is coming into all these businesses and we don't have to do anything. It just takes care of itself. Well, no, it doesn't. And we've, we've had the impacts of that um, very, very clearly shown. So. We, we are now seeing a, a turnaround. I mean, um, you know, I know it's happening in the Cairngorms and in, in Loch Lomond and Tossics, as well as across the country in these honeypot areas like Shihali and, and Perth and, in Perth and Kinross and so on. Um, so hopefully um, it's not a quick fix. It's never a quick fix, but hopefully um, every sector. Yes. I mean, I, I remember sitting on a group talking about camping back in about 2006, seven. How could we get the industry to to do this and I think uh, SNH as was then did get them to put little swing tags on tents as they were sold. I mean, you know, nothing ever gets finished in education does it, you just have to keep doing it again and again and again as each generation comes forward. Thank you. We're getting, the questions are dividing themselves into two areas really. We've got the whole rewilding area and then we've got the whole access area. So if we just take one more on the access area and then we'll come back to the rewilding. And we've got questions about wolves and sheep and all sorts of things. Um, just one, one more on um, responsible access. And I'm gonna ask Lauren this one, please. Um, this is from Tracy McLachlan. Would you like to ask your question, Tracy? Hello. Hi. Can you see me? Um, my question is how you, you make responsible access available to all and not just to the rich, because um, it, rewilding, as far as I see it, is very much sort of seen as a um, 
uh, a holiday for the rich. Um, the, the, there's lots of um, rewilding initiatives which are um, offering sort of experiences in rewilding and they're all costing £1,500 a week um, to go and look at rewilding. And it just, as far as I can see, it just makes it look like rewilding is for rich people. Um, how do you make it available to all? Okay. Thanks. Um, Lauren, could you answer that in relation to um, access and skiing as well, perhaps try and bring it yeah. together? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, and I think, so, um, where will I start with this? I'll start with a few years ago, um, I made a movie, uh, a film with uh, the outdoor clothing brand Patagonia, which I'm pretty sure most of you will on, on this call uh, will, be, will be familiar with. And the film was called Right to Roam and it won, it did really well and it won a few um, awards and it's on YouTube that you can see. And it's got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of YouTube uh, views on it. <clears throat> and I think the reason that that film did so well was it was just me and my friends basically talking snowboarding or splitboarding. So, you know, walking up the hill um, and then uh, and snowboarding. And I think what 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 captured people's imagination about the right to roam and and, and and access was it was just people could really almost imagine themselves having that same sort of story being you know and telling the stories of going out with your with your friends and having these life-changing moments and you know those days where <laughs> uh you get lost off the back of Cairngorm and you know then you all kind of squabble about it and then uh, and then, you know, uh, have a pint at the old bridge in and, and, and have a laugh about it. And I think it's, yeah, so I think that's kind of using the brands and uh, getting out to out to the masses, you know, like to, through how people want to be, um, how people want to be, um, you know, talked to as well. You know, YouTube's obviously a good resource. So I think ten, telling stories uh, and almost talking about how amazing our access law is and how um, and how that's open to everyone, um, and I think you know how is it access for not just the rich. I think again, what, kind of what Helen was saying, you know, this is uh, a massive you know systemic problem, um, and I think um, getting that into education and also people that look <laughs> and talk like like us and seeing that representation in the outdoors, I think, is really important because it has been a very let's be honest, um, you know, um, white, very male dominated space. And I think there's uh, a lot of room for other voices to, to appear and to come through. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, telling those stories and um, with, more, with more diverse voices um, will also create more welcoming spaces that people want to want to be a part of. So, yeah, that was a very long winded uh, <laughs> to, uh, yeah. Uh, that question in two parts. That's great. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I'm going to do something now and to combine two questions. So there's two questions on the reintroduction of large predators. There's one from Susanna Peel and then there's one from Theo. Can I ask Susanna to ask hers and then Theo to ask his and then we'll come probably to Steve and John on these two. So Susanna first. Yeah, certainly. So mainly it's regarding large predators and the bad reputation that reintroducing them has, especially wolves. I've just been recently reading a book which perhaps a lot of you will have read on The Last Wolf and how important they are and how much the science does back up a reintroduction program. So I'd be really interested to hear your views on, on that. And I understand it's a really contentious issue, so um, it'll be interesting to hear from everyone. Thanks, Susanna. And Theo, would you like to ask yours? And then I'll get Steve and John to answer them. Yeah, so my question is, how would you work with farmers if you were introduced um, a large predator like a pack of wolves or a lynx as the sheep or whatever cattle or farm animal they may have might be targeted? Cool. Thank you both. Steve? Yeah, great questions and very difficult, thorny issues to try to resolve. Um, I'll start with um, the, the second question first, which was sort of about how you work with 
the farmers and the farming community around animals like lynx. Um, I believe that um, the way to work through this is to talk and discuss the idea over quite an extended period uh, to, to allay fears, to understand concerns and to work to try to resolve those concerns. So for lynx, you know, the big concern among the farming community is that they might take sheep, whereas I'm sure many people will have read uh, Dave Hetherington's book about lynx. And there is a, quite a lot of evidence basically that lynx are um, stealth predators. They tend to hunt in woodlands and forests. So the chances of them ever getting close to a sheep or wanting to take a sheep is extremely remote because they don't they won't they won't particularly cross paths. So there's an ecological answer that, that that lynx don't tend to occupy the habitats that sheep occupy in Scotland. Different story in Norway where sometimes you find sheep in woodlands. But how do we allay the fears? How do we get to a point where people can at least have the evidence and and the arguments to be able to make their own decision? Because a lot of this is about emotion. I have an emotional desire to see large predators back in Scotland, like I'm sure many of people. Uh, here tonight do but many many farmers are very fearful of, of that and fearful of their livelihoods and we have to understand their perspective and we have to do this by consent because if we, if we don't do it by consent unfortunately uh, if we get to the point of reintroduction it will all go horribly wrong so we have to take this really slowly and do it by consent wolves are even more difficult because of the myths and legends surrounding wolves a few years ago i was actually traveling through the dolomites in italy and i was coming back to the uk from living in Malta and I was walking on a trail in the Dolomites, I had my, my three dogs on the lead and this thing that I thought was a German shepherd walked straight out in front of me about 100 meters ahead of us. It looked at us it just, and I just thought, oh that's not a German shepherd, that's something altogether different. It literally just looked at us, knew we were there and slinked off into the forest and we never ever saw it again. So wolves can be around you all the time and you're, they, they will generally not uh, interact with people that much but of course they will affect farmers and farmers interests so the journey to reintroducing wolf in my opinion is going to take a very very long time indeed if we ever get there whereas predators that will are much less likely to cause damage to, to farmers interests I think the arguments are pretty sound and pretty strong and we should we should work on the ones that we might be able to get and for me that's links but we need to do it by, by consent because if we don't it will all go horribly wrong and it won't work anyway. Thanks, Steve. John, what's your perspective on this? Oh, gosh, this is such a thorny question. I think that, that you know, if, if you put links in tomorrow, no one would ever know anything about it. The, the links would simply disappear. They're very secretive uh, and there are plenty of roe deer and hares and things for them to eat. And by the way, uh, um, I've worked with links in Scandinavia and um, they, they hunt by ambush. And so they won't go out into the middle of a field. Uh, so the chances of them killing sheep are actually very slim. If you go to Switzerland, for instance, where sheep and goats are herded in woods, then yes, lynx kill sheep and they kill goats. And uh, the authorities turn out and shoot the lynx. Um, but I think that it, in the Scottish situation, I think quite honestly, we could easily cope with lynx. Wolves are a very different matter. And although um, I would absolutely love to think that we were going to get wolves back in the highlands of Scotland one day, I don't think it's likely to be in my lifetime. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, Steve is absolutely right. He's got to be done by consent. But most of all, we have to have the right habitat. And unfortunately, uh, the Highlands of Scotland is strung with deer fences. Uh, it is uh, huge blocks of uh, com commercial forestry with virtually no prey species in them at all. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, and timber wolves cover vast different distances. You know, they rock up in Socky Hall Street. And I just don't think that we are in a place uh, ready for the wolf at the moment. I think that, you know, maybe a, a, a big uh, um, uh, group of estates coming together with a, in a rewilding project for 25 years uh, might be able to do an exploratory wolf reintroduction, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. 
Thank you very much. We've got an interesting question linked to this from Diana Gilbert. Diana, are you happy to ask your question? Um, okay, if it makes sense. Um, basically, I was listen I was involved in uh, or joined in the Oikos Norwegian Oikos meeting last week, and there was a very um, eloquent talk from a uh, John Linnell about how the Utmark um, philosophy in Norway of basically living with uh, wildlife uh, and all the top predators uh, is being eroded by much greater sort of um, building of huts and etc. But how they really needed to get it back. And it really led me to thinking, well, we basically manage our wildlife in very small protected areas and should we really be trying to think on a much larger scale um, there's the proposal to increase protected areas to 30% of Scotland, but is that really actually going to help a great deal? Do we need to think much more radically about how we look after wildlife? Thanks, Diana. John, what, is, what are your thoughts on that one? Well, I'm very wary of um, answering Diana Gilbert on anything because she, <laughs> she knows a lot more than I do. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Diana. Oh, nice to Hi, you. John. <laughs> uh, uh, Diana, for everybody else's benefit, is a brilliant ecologist and um, a specialist on uh, upland montane woodland. Um, I now can't remember what the question was, but I think <laughs> I, think I know. Um, the, the Norwegian model is fascinating, and I've studied it a bit. Uh, I used to run a training program just outside Trondheim for rangers. Uh, I did it for 12 consecutive years. And I, I just want to tell you one little anecdote, which I think demonstrates Diana's point. Um, we were, we were uh, researching, we we're doing a fact-finding mission on beavers before the official reintroduction of beavers to Scotland. And I had with me a, a, a group of, uh, of people who were very motivated to reintroduce beavers to Scotland. And we went up to a very small field farm, right at the head of a field, uh, right up in the mountains. And uh, as we arrived there, uh, we could see straight away that he had beavers on his land because uh, you, you could see the, uh, um, the tree felling on the stream and, uh, and, and so on. And we went through to the, the farmhouse and I said to him, um, once we'd done introductions, I said, I see you have beavers on your stream. And he said, oh, yeah, 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 we have the beaver. Yeah, he lives there. And I thought, hmm, that's, that's a hell of a good start. Um, and then I said, and what do you do when he's a nuisance to you and he fells your apple trees? Uh, and he said, oh, well, then we shoot him and we eat him and we make a hat for the wife. And, uh, uh, and I said, oh, gosh, I see. Yes, that's quite a radical solution. Uh, um, but a moment ago, you said he lives there. Are you entirely happy for him to live there? Oh, yeah, yeah, the believer, the beaver, he belongs there. And I was very taken by that because here was a farmer who was capable of uh, experiencing damage or uh, disruption or something by beavers, but he completely accepted that they belonged there. They were part of his native wildlife and he liked that. And I think that is, Diana's touched on that. There's, there's an attitude of mind in some parts of Scandinavia, particularly actually in the north of Norway and in Sweden and Finland, um, that, uh, that wildlife is accepted. Wolves are accepted, bears are accepted, uh, beavers certainly accepted, um, and we aren't there. Well, our general population has not accepted wildlife in that way. The general population doesn't believe that these things uh, belong in our uh, uh, landscapes. And that's where we've got to go. And Diana is right in being concerned about um, people uh, uh, um, simply uh, uh, taking uh, wildness over for recreation purposes uh, without properly understanding that wildlife has to have a right to be there too. 
Thank you very much. This this links um, to a couple of questions that we've had on the role of government in this. So we've got one question from Nervid. I, I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced that quite right. And one from Alistair as well. So would you both like to ask your question, Nervid? Would you like to ask yours? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to know how engaged the, anyone in the Scottish government is in these discussions. Um, and some of the very forward looking ideas that there's so much care and thought and creativity in Scotland just now, it's bursting all over the place about this. How much are the Scottish government engaged? And if so, who in the Scottish government is engaged? Okay, thank you. And I'm just going to ask Alistair to ask his as well, because it's linked. Okay, thanks. Uh, how do you evaluate the contribution of forestry and land Scotland to restoration ecology and what needs to change. Uh, I'm actually involved with a, a community woodland uh, in Loch Goyle, Argyle, and we've just leased that woodland 64 hectares from uh, FLS, but we're surrounded, I mean, this is a fragment of Scotland's temperate rainforest in some Atlantic oaks and so on, but we're surrounded by Sitka spruce. So all the time we're having to remove these Sitka spruce saplings as they appear uh, in our, our woodland. So what do you think? Great, thank you. I'm going to start with Helen because Helen mentioned um, talking to, to government and politicians and then I'm going to go on to Steve. So Helen, you're first. Okay, just a, a couple of quick points. Um, in my experience with the government, um, they definitely get the public health message, but the um, the other side of things, the nature side of things is a bit more of a challenge. Um, what I would say is um, Mr Ewing, who has been in the past um, in charge of obviously forestry, agriculture and so forth, um, when he got the tourism brief, I saw a very different side from him because suddenly he was working in a sector where he was able to give money into people he was working with across the, 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 the sector and, and he was incredibly efficient. Um, but yes, perhaps that, that's enough said on that one. Forestry and Land Scotland, um, yes, they they could do a lot more to support, in, in my sector, could do a lot more to support recreation. Uh, I know that's not quite what you, you asked about, Alistair, so, but um, they say in their strategy they are they want to be the um, number one um, sort of provider for um, tourism and so on, and they, they have some fantastic people working for them. But there's always a bit of foot dragging. I mean, for example, we know that for years, um, in, uh, informal campsites have been disappearing and that's why people are ending up camping at the side of the road. So wouldn't it be great if Forestry and Land Scotland started developing more campsites for people at low cost? And the other, and the other thing, um, camper vans, I know they, last year, they did run a very small um, little pilot scheme to see how camper vans could be incorporated into their forest. They've got all these estates. It would be lovely if they were a lot more proactive and really supported recreation because I think that the problem is that um, they're forestry, that's what they do. Um, but actually 18% of forestry, of, of the economic value of forestry in Scotland, 18% is from recreation and tourism. So it's actually a massive part of that sector, and yet you'd never know it if you look at most of their, their documents. So, um, you know, we're seeing all the time new planting happens and, you know, paths which were in existence are just, they just get planted over because they weren't a, an official whole path or right away, so it doesn't really matter. It's like, but, you know, forestry is a big block on the landscape, so it does need um, a lot more uh, thought for how people can engage with woods and, and how people can enjoy them. But um, I'll, I'll finish there. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Helen. Steve, the role of government and forestry land Scotland. Yeah, I think I think on rewilding, we're at the very beginning of the journey with the Scottish government on this one. Um, rewilding is challenging because it's about change and changing the way you think about the land and the sea and how we work with it. So there's a definite kind of paradigm as we manage everything and rewilding is, is pushing us to think about working with things and that's a real challenge for most humans and it's a definite challenge for the Scottish Government at the moment but there is some bright light around so just before the current parliament dissolved we had a motion uh, put forward by Gail Ross a SMP MSP supporting the idea of a rewilding nation and 28 MSPs signed that motion with an MSP from every single 
political party uh, in Parliament at the time. And we're probably going to run that again with the Greens to see what the new Parliament looks like. And, and we think we are at a bit of a crossroads. If the Scottish Government wants to help to solve the climate crisis, and that's a very definite ambition of the Scottish Government, and the problems that we're facing now with biodiversity, things like rewilding, ecological restoration can help with both and with human well-being as well. And I think it's our job as, as kind of NGOs and as the public at large to say, actually, we want to see this change. We want to see a better relationship with the natural world. And ScotGov, we'd like you to lead the way. But that's going to take quite a lot of work to get there, I feel. And we're just at the very start of the process. I want to say something nice about Forestry and Land Scotland, um, uh, because actually they have done some really good things in a few patches. So they're part of Cairngorms Connect, which is probably... Uh, the uh, the most interesting, most exciting rewilding project actually in delivery in Scotland at the moment. And where I work in Trees for Life, you know, they have stewarded and looked after Glen Affric, which is one of the nicest, most beautiful um, Caledonian pine woods in Scotland, in my opinion. So when they are empowered, and it's government that decides what they do, when they are, they are empowered to work with nature, they will and they can. And again, it's it's down to government policy. And unfortunately, what we've started to see is government policy focus on commercial forestry, traditional kind of Sitka spruce type plantations again, because of the commercial pressure for more timber. And that is inhibiting FLS and others from saying, actually, there is another way. We can have forestry that works with nature, the sort of stuff that John was talking about a bit earlier on. That's where we need to go. But again, the government are their masters and they will put they will follow what the government tells them to do so it's down to people like us everybody here tonight to, to persuade scott gov to, to work with nature not against it um Debra, right. Debra, could i just come in very quickly yes i i really believe that um I, what i want to say is watch this space because the evidence coming out of harvard in the early 2000s is that native woodland captures and retains carbon far more efficiently than commercial plantation. And I think that as the climate change argument gets really hot, I think that we are going to see dramatic changes in forestry practice. And I think that um, uh, uh, um, what used to be the Forestry Commission, I can never get a hold of its right name now, um, I think is going to be, whether it's kicking and screaming because of the industry demands or not, we are going to see real change in the forestry industry towards more native woodland, and it's long overdue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to Julian St. Clair now, who's got a um, question about careers. Um, Julian, would you like to ask your question? I'm going to add a little bit onto it rather cheekily. So if you could ask it and then I'll add a bit on. Yes, of course. I hope you can hear me all right. Yep. Um, so I've been volunteering with the RSPB for like five years now and um, sort of looking at studying things like wildlife conservation and countryside management at college to give you a sort of brief idea. And over the last couple of years, I've been hearing a lot about various rewilding projects, in particular Cairngorms Connect, and thought I'd take this opportunity to ask you people who are so involved in this area if you had any advice of potential ways to continue and move forwards in this area, uh, because currently, at least in my thinking, this would be an area that I would love to take forwards um, as far as I can, really. And if I can do it in such, if I can involve myself in this area in such a way that it gives me money so I can afford to keep on doing it as much as possible, that would be my goal. So thank you for any input that you can have on this. Great, thank you, Julian. So I'm gonna um, ask Steve, because Steve is, is uh, mentioned the, how the Trees for Life were, were tackling this. But then um, once Steve's answered, I'd like to ask Lauren, the same question, but in terms of snow sports and getting into outdoors. So we could come to Lauren afterwards, after Steve, perhaps. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, getting into conservation, rewilding is a long slog, um, I'm afraid. And I think many of us that work in it have been through it, but 
it's a career worth pursuing. So Julian, please pursue it because I think uh, I think you sound really passionate about it and passion is 90% of what you need in conservation and in, in rewilding because if you don't have the passion I think it's probably quite soon you'll be quite demoralized by everything because it's such a hard slog so please keep going in terms of rewilding careers a lot of what you're being trained in in terms of traditional conservation will be used in rewilding a lot of the traditional uh, kind of things like you know grouse moor management like um, forestry management like what deer stalkers do are needed in rewilding because we don't have a balanced ecosystem therefore all of those traditional sorts of skills that we currently employ need to be I believe repurposed to, to aid rewilding to aid natural solutions until nature can take care of itself so I only think this sector is going to continue to grow we in Trees for Life run a, a training program uh, we have five trainees a year that come and live and work at Dundregan our estate to learn how to kind of work in rewilding, but they're doing horticulture, they're doing deer management, they're doing surveys, just the same sort of things that any ecologist or any land-based industry person does. They're just doing it for a different objective. And that's the thing that we need to get across is we're working to different objectives in rewilding to the traditional land management ones, and even the traditional conservation ones, trying to get to a point where nature can begin to take care of itself. So keep going and keep, keep working on it because uh, it, it's 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 a career worth pursuing and it's just so rewarding so I wish you luck and just keep going because I'm sure you'll get there but think about what you've learned and what you know and how to apply that to rewilding and just working to different objectives oh that was a that was a lovely answer Steve and I yeah I think um yeah I mean again um I guess so on conservation I, I can't really help with but with in terms of getting a job at NGOs and things. I mean, we just recently went out for a marketing manager and um, we had 172 applications for one job. And what some of my advice for, for you is that when you're writing your cover letter, passion always shines through. Passion always, always will shine through. And there was a few candidates that got to the final five that were maybe less experienced, but their cover letters were so passionate. And you can kind of tell that it's not just a job and that people are really going to want to be you know really want to create that better world because you're gonna have bad days at the office when we were working in <laughs> in nature restoration where you're working carbon issues you know campaign wins come along but they don't come along that that often you know so it's having that passion having that motivation um to 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 kind of to, to keep going and um, my other point is also and Steve alluded to this is that learn to spin lots of plates if you if you kind of go in and have quite a rigid idea of what what you, you kind of want to achieve i think um being able to be flexible and wear many hats especially in the outdoor industry is um is very 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 important so um yeah be, be prepared to be thrown in at the deep end and wear several hats Thank you. We've, we've still got a few questions um, to go, but I'd like to um, kind of ask an, a catch-all question of each member of the panel um, in terms of the, and try and tie some of them together. Um, in terms of what's your, what panelists is your vision for the future, given we are where we are? What's, what would you like to see happen in the future going forward, given where we are today? And I'll ask all of you that perhaps, and if you could manage to weave into that a bit about beavers and a bit about woodland management that would be all the better but don't don't feel the need to if you don't want to can i start with you sir john oh dear yes all right um a, a very long time ago when i first became interested in conservation as a teenager um really it was in its infancy it was embryonic and then in the 1960s and 70s um, uh, the outdoor movement, the environmental movement, uh, came from the United States across to Britain and caught on here. And suddenly people started joining the RSPB and the Wildlife Trust. And we saw exponential growth, particularly in the big uh, popular charities like RSPB, it went from being a small bird club to being a really powerful membership driven uh, um, NGO within the space of about 20 years. And I thought that was going to make a huge difference. But in reality, it hasn't. 
I mean, the RSPB is a great organization. I'm a vice president. I'm very proud of having worked for RSPB for many years. But it has, and it has produced beautiful nature reserves. And it's got a, a, a wonderful magazine. It reaches an awful lot of people. But the reality is that nature has continued to be stressed and to decline. And so we've got to do much, much better than that. Um, and I, that's why I'm optimistic now that with climate change forcing us to face these issues, we have a real opportunity. And I started right at the beginning of this evening saying that we're on the cusp. We're, there is a, an opportunity coming which we mustn't miss. Uh, and I sincerely hope that the general population will fall in behind that. Uh, and of course, it's vital that politicians do as well. I think politicians will have to. Kicking and screaming, they will probably have to. Lovely, thank you. Steve, what about you? Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think John's absolutely right. Although there's been some amazing NGOs and they've done some amazing work, somehow we've still failed really because biodiversity is in more of a crisis now than you know I'm in my 50s and uh, it's still in crisis and it was in crisis when I was growing up as a teenager as far as I remember and I'm sure John would um, would would experience is even more compelling on on that level so the answer for me is more better and different you know we have to do things differently because the current model isn't really working protected areas have their place but we have to work in on in a much bigger scale on a much wider landscape to see that to see the improvements that we're wanting to see on beavers i'd love to be in a position where um, we are allowed legally to take beavers that are destined to be currently killed on the river tay and reintroduce them to the river systems in scotland where they will do no harm to anybody but will do their great work of rewilding if we can get to that point i give, give, give myself goosebumps just saying it we will see some amazing changes in our landscape and we will start to learn that nature does great work for us and like that norwegian friend of john's we want them to be there and on woodland management to get to a point in an organization like trees for life where we can actually allow the woodlands to regenerate on their own and do what they want to do uh, rather than to have to plant the, the, the start of the process to do some planting in the future, to get to the place where we get natural regeneration of woodlands because the landscape is moving and the landscape is changing. There are enough seed, seed sources out there for it to look after itself. That would be amazing. I don't know how long that's going to take, but I suspect I, don't, I will not be around when rewilding kind of fully uh, looks, nature fully looks after itself in a kind of rewilding idea. But we need to try and get there because that's the answer. Nature, nature knows best. Thanks, Steve. Helen. Okay, well, I won't repeat any of that, which is so eloquently said by, by Steve and John. Um, I'll look for people. What I would like to see is that the vast, the big, a big proportion of the population uh, feels that it's normal for them to go outdoors, that they understand nature, that they enjoy being outdoors, they have a sense of ownership, so they don't leave litter. They, they have been educated uh, over the years, so they understand their responsibilities. Um, and it's across all sectors of society. And I think that was that was mentioned earlier. Um, I think it's incredibly important that it's we do reach into those communities who don't get into the outdoors and don't regularly get those benefits of nature. We really need to help them to, um, to, to get those benefits that we all have. Things like really simple things like transport. I mean, if you don't have a car, it's incredibly difficult to get out of the cities into into the central belt. I, I know it, out of the central belt. I know it can be done, but it is difficult. And there's that extra barrier. Gear. I mean, you don't actually need super expensive gear. I'm sure I'm not the only person who grew up before Gore-Tex was invented. You know, we had all sorts of rubbish gear in the past. Uh, you don't actually need to spend a lot of money, but there are these barriers that are ahead of people. So it would be fantastic if. Um, more people and obviously I don't know how many that is but more people could get out into the outdoors and enjoy it. Thanks Helen and Lauren. Oh yeah it's hard to follow up all these I mean, you know, eloquent answers. I mean, what do I see for the future? I think I'm oh, what I like to see. I would like to see us use this incredible position that we've got ourselves <laughs> into to reimagine 
our communities. And I said at the beginning, you know, I think the, that the climate crisis is a, is a connection crisis. And I think if we can actually use this, you know, use this crisis as a way to actually, you know, reconnect with the land, own the land, be on the land, you know, let develop it with, with the communities in mind. Um, like Helen said, have it so people feel proud and feel ownership and, and feel a part of the outdoor community and have and live healthy, happy lifestyles by, by getting out there and being encouraged to get out of there. And I think, um, you know, and, and to do that in a just way as well, that we move away fairly and fastly away from fossil fuels. Um, and, you know, we have the just transition um, and use this as a, as a way to, to reimagine um, uh, our community so yeah I think um, I'm really looking yeah I'm really looking forward to that challenge and I hope that that's a vision that we can all participate in to, to build together. Thank you Lauren thank, thank you panel um, just before I hand back to, to Grant I just wanted to um, bring that together really to say that um, we've recognised that we're at a junction and Lauren put that very very well just now and where we need to reset our relationship with nature, whether we go down the Norwegian route of doing that or whether we find our own route for doing that. But we do need to value our nature and recognize that nature has a place in our world alongside us, but at the same time, enable others to, to do that as well and to, to take care. So we've obviously got a role. Um, I hope that you've been given lots of um, inspiring ideas of, of what you can do, both as an individual, as a volunteer perhaps, as a visitor to, to nature and to the landscape, as a voter or as a lobbyist. And on that last point, I did just want to let you know that um, Link is running our Fight for Scotland's Nature campaign. And on Thursday next week, we're launching a new action and we're asking for legally binding targets to protect nature. We've got ambitious climate targets that are helping us move towards net zero but we've not got an equivalent to nature. So we're asking the government to sign up to that and to put nature targets into action. So keep an eye on our website and help us get that message across to government that we need targets for nature too. Um, and on that, I hope you've got many, many more ideas. That's just one, one little thing that we could all do, but keep going outside, keep enjoying nature and keep talking about it. Talk to all your, all your friends about what we need to do and how we can do our best to protect it. I'm going to um, hand over back to Grant now to say thank you. Thanks, Deborah. And uh, no, it's great. And thanks for all your questions tonight. It's been been excellent to to hear the debate and and, and all the all the answers from our, from our panelists as well. Um, one thing I would just say is that I suppose all that we've discussed tonight is exactly what the the Cairngorms National Park's here to do. It's four and a half thousand square kilometres. It's absolutely working at that landscape scale and trying to make sure that all these things can can come together and, and these debates can happen, which is why we have things like the Cairngorms Nature Big Weekend. So a massive thank you to all our panelists uh, for the contributions tonight and thanks to all the questions and for you attending this evening um, on a Saturday evening. There are lots of things to do, uh, to listen to, to see on the Cairngorms Nature Big Weekend website. Um, but thanks once again to you all and um, I hope you all have a good weekend. <laughs>